The last element of this lecture is about operators, in particular the so-called backward shift operator. And here, an operator A is a function of a time series or stochastic process being lowercase or uppercase letters. When we apply an operator, well, what we get is a new time series. Likewise, a new stochastic process. The most important operator that we're going to use is the backward shift operator. That what it does when you apply that on xt, what you get is xt minus 1. So you just step one step backwards in time. So of course, if you do that j times, you step j steps backwards in time. And all other operators that we're going to consider today are expressed relative to b. So the first thing to look at is rather than going backwards, we can go forward. So the forward shift operator, when you call it f, when we apply that to xt, you get xt plus 1. And of course, ft to the j power steps, j steps forward in time. So that's transparent. Now, what is the inverse of going forward? That is to go backward. So they are kind of obviously each other's inverse. So if you take j to be a negative value up here, say f to the minus first, that gives you exactly x on xt, gives you xt minus 1, which is applying the backward shift operator. So I don't have to do more proof, I think, than just this verbal proof that they are each other's inverse. The difference operator that we have here, when you apply that on xt, what you get is the difference between xt and xt minus 1. Thereby the difference operator. Now, if we want to express that as part as function of b, well, what we have here, xt, that's the identity operator 1 on xt, and xt minus 1, that's b xt. So we can treat this as an operator that is 1 minus b as an own operator on xc. So the difference operator is defined as 1 minus b. Again, we can take that to some power. Then it will be 1 minus b to that power. The next one is the so-called summation. So the summation of the time series is the sum of, of the time xt. It's the sum from xt and all the way backwards in time to the beginning of time. Now, that again, you can say xt minus 1, that's b xt. xt minus 2 is b to the second power xt, and so forth. So we can have this infinite polynomial just with the powers of b. And we can say b to the zero power is just the identity operator. So to go zero step backwards in time is to stay where you are. That makes a lot of sense. Now, the summation, if we do that, and then difference afterwards, so we do the summation of xt, and then difference. Well, first we do, then we do the summation of xt, if we do the difference operator of the summation of xt, then we do the summation of xt minus the summation of xt minus 1. Then we can take the first element out of this up here and say summation of xt is xt plus the summation of xt minus 1. And if you then have subtract the summation of t minus 1, well, then we get xt. So now we've shown that the difference operator on the summation are each other inverse. And we'll do the reverse as well. We'll do the summation of the difference. It's basically the same thing as what we did before. Now we have the summation here that we apply on xt and on xt minus 1. And again, if we compare the different powers of b, we see that everything but the 1 cancels out, and we get xt. So the difference operator and the summation operator are each other inverse. So we can say the inverse of the difference operator is 1 over 1 minus b. And it's also the same as the infinite sum of the b to the corresponding powers, which we define as the summation operator. 
Okay, so the properties of all these four different operators is that they are all, I mean, one, some of those promises are, they are all linear. So if you apply that operator on, in this case, a weighted sum of two time series, well, then it corresponds to applying it on each of the time series and do the same weighted sum outside. So it's a linear operator, and we can combine operators into one. We did it already by defining the difference operator as one minus b having the one as an identity operator. So we could say if we have this power series here, then we can apply any operator in here and say it's an infinite sum, which the difference to what we did looked at before for the summation is that now we can have some coefficients in here as weights. And that we will use a lot throughout the rest of this course. So just a couple of examples. We already look at the difference operator inverse of that. If we use set instead of b here, well, then it is an infinite sum of the powers. That's the definition of this. So that, al that also means that the summation is, as said before, an infinite sum of b to the i power. So that we're just using the usual calculation rules from what we've seen previously in our mathematics courses. And given this, of course, as we saw before, we can also say, well, what if we have some weights? And you can say a polynomial does not have to be infinite. We can say that whenever you get to a certain length in the sequence, then all the weights that are further out, they're just zero. And then we can just say, well, we have, in this case, a q order polynomial so we can define a theta b here, theta b as 1 plus theta 1, b plus so forth, down to theta q and b to the q power. So to only have powers up to a certain, oh sorry, have elements up to a certain power of b. And you can say in this up here, you can say it's generic also for i equals 0. But what we choose to do is to pick the first one to be a 1. And the reason for that is when we get later into estimating models, if we do this, we can then get an, an estimate of the uncertainty, sigma, epsilon, which if we do not fix this, then you can multiply one by two, and then the other one is halved. So we need to fix one of the two in order to get a stable, a good behaving estimator. Now, one of the more, you can say, mind-boggling things is when you start to multiply these operators together to do the so-called Cauchy product or the discrete convolution. What we have to do to get to the zero order? Well, we have to take everything that where we can add the powers to be zero. So that's lambda zero and phi zero. Now, to get the first order here, we can take either lam lambda at first power of, of b, but then you need to have psi at like a zero power, or you can do the reverse. And when you continue doing this, basically saying that the product here, we need to do all the combinations of the input, the uh, thing that we are multiplying together, that gives the same sum as what we have out here. So the power of b should be the same in the result out here. So we just start with i and 0, and then we subtract 1 and add 1 until we get to lambda 0 and psi i. That by we get all the different combinations that we have. That, of course, also applied when we have operators with weights and things on. So we co say that if this equation is satisfied, then we have, with these operators up here, then we can define them such that this holds. Then the lambda, psi, and pi that we have in here, those weights in here, or coefficients, they fulfill this equation down here, or set of equations, which it actually is. As we have one for each, it's one set of equations. So what have we covered today? 
Well, we have looked at simple exponential smoothing, which is essentially a local trend model for just predicting the mean values. It's a local mean model. We have this general expression here, but what we should focus on is that we can do iterative updates of this. From this definition here, we have the iterative update. We should also focus on the main operators that we're going to use later on are the backward shift operator and the different operator. So with all, thank you for now. Bye-bye. <laughs>